After struggling with chronic IBS, constipation, bloating, gas, abdominal pain, and other gut issues for 10 years, I've now fully healed my gut and been completely symptom-free and pain-free for the last seven years. Now, a lot went into my healing journey. I took courses, I got a bachelor's degree in nutrition, I got a certification in gut health management, I read articles, I watched lots of videos, but one of the most important things that I did was to read books. So over the last several years, I've read 24 different nutrition and health books, at least that's how many I could remember by name when I was counting them all. And today I'm gonna share with you my top six books that were the most impactful on my healing journey and that I think you should read if you want to learn to heal your gut and how to optimally nourish your body. I'm also going to share what I learned from each of those six books so that you can learn a little bit and have some good book recommendations all in one. So the very first book is Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price. This is the gold standard for ancestral nutrition. It, it is all about Dr. Weston A. Price. So if you haven't heard of him before, he was a dentist in the early 1900s. And in the 1930s, he traveled all around the world because he wanted to learn what made people healthy, what diets made people healthy, how it affected their teeth and how it affected their overall health. So he looked at what he called isolated peoples and then modernized people. So he looked at 12 different groups and for the isolated people, basically they were people that were isolated from modern trade and modern civilization in one way or another. So they might live very high up in the mountains where a lot of people can't access the region like the people in the Swiss Alps or they might be on some remote island where boats don't come by very often. So typically there was some sort of ge geographical reason why these people were isolated, but because they were isolated from modern trade, they weren't able to get flour and sugar and all of these modern treats. And they were still eating the way their ancestors had for a very long time. So Dr. Price would look at these people. He actually traveled there, went there, saw what they ate, examined their teeth, examined their overall health. And he noted what foods are actually ancestral foods and consistent with what people have eaten for a very long time. And then he would go to a neighboring population. So he would go somewhere close by, but to a group of people that had access to modern trade, had incorporated these new foods like refined flour and sugar, preserved foods um, that were preserved like by canning, um, like marmalades, coffee was another one in there. And he just looked at the differences in their diet and differences in health. And basically what he found was each time people introduced newer foods like sugar, white flour, refined grains, vegetable or seed oils, jams, sweets, canned foods, coffee, things like that into their diet, their health declined rapidly. Now, they became more susceptible to diseases like tuberculosis. So he noticed that the people that were still eating like their ancestors, the isolated groups of people, rarely ever got tuberculosis, but the rates were very, very high in the people that had adopted these new modern foods. He also noticed that people's teeth began to get very crooked. They also began to get a lot of cavities. So the um, isolated peoples, he noted very specifically each one, what percentage of cavities they had. He looked at a lot of mouths, took a lot of pictures. You can look at them in the book, but essentially, 0.01 to 5% um, cavity rate is what was common amongst the isolated people. It varied a little bit from group to group, but when they moved away from the ancestral diet, incorporated those foods, I was talking about the sugar, the refined flour, the, the canned foods, then their cavity rate went up to 35 to 90 per, 95%, which is basically like the teeth affected by cavities. Now, another thing that happened was their faces actually changed shape. So their nasal passages got more narrow and they weren't able to breathe through their noses as much, which led to a lot of mouth breathing. 
and not having their tongue at the top of their mouth where it should be. When your tongue is at the top of your mouth, it's supporting the optimal formation in your mouth and it also encourages mouth breathing and it like lifts your face up in the proper way. You can look into mewing if you wanna learn about that more, but it is so huge. So these modernized people were breathing incorrectly. Their faces were too narrow, their teeth were too narrow, and they just weren't getting a proper facial development that's very symmetrical. Um, he also noted that women's hips started to get more narrow. They weren't able to birth quite as easily. Mental retarda retardation became so much more common. Uh, people's eyesight got a lot worse. Their intelligence decreased, arthritis increased, um, and then cripples and physical deform deformities increased a lot as well. So those are just a few things, but he noticed a tremendous difference between the health of the isolated people and the modernized people. And what he came to conclude was it wasn't just about the foods they introduced, it was more about the foods that they were now leaving out. Our ancestors praised the most nutrient dense foods because even though they didn't think about it in that way that we now think about it of these are high in nutrients they're good for us they knew that they were foods that were very good for them and supported optimal health so foods like organs fish eggs seafood dairy those are all incredibly nutrient dense foods eating nose to tail so eating as much of the animal as possible and that really contributed to their health having all of those excellent nutrients helped to build a healthy body, it helped to build strong teeth, and it helped make sure that their bodies had enough nutrients for everything. The modern foods that I was talking about earlier, the seed oils, the sugar, the flour, the canned foods, the sweets, the jams, they just are not nutrient dense. So essentially what the modernized people did was they took the most nutrient dense foods out of their diet and replaced them with practically the least nutrient dense foods. They got a lot of nutrient deficiencies and therefore a lot of health problems. A few really interesting things that he noted as well is that these people prepared their plants properly. So grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds were all soaked or sprouted or fermented prior to consuming. Because even though our ancestors didn't think about it as, oh, these are high anti-nutrient foods that are going to be hard to digest and decrease our nutrient absorption like we know now, they knew that these foods were hard to digest and they had to be prepared intentionally to be able to be consumed without causing issues. So he found people that made really good sourdough bread that just soaked, sprouted, or fermented those foods. And they ate seasonal fruits and veggies, but the priority was on those animal foods. So, oh, so also he was very surprised to find that there was no vegan or vegetarian uh, groups at all. Every single group that he looked at ate meat and animal foods. And also a really interesting thing that he noted that's going to connect to another book in a few books, um, is that it was really important for the isolated peoples, the more ancestral people, to prioritize eating nutrient-dense foods prior to conception in order to have healthier children. So they had a lot of practices about eating liver, acquiring salmon eggs, eating butter that was in the spring because the cows were all grazing on green grass and the butter was more nutrient-dense. They had a lot of practices around eating these specific nutrient-dense foods to prepare their body for pregnancy. Now this was for both men and women sometimes. It was very focused on women, but also on men. And essentially, they prepared their body for pregnancy by eating a lot of nutrient-dense foods so that they would have plenty of nutrients for their baby to build a healthy body and for them to retain their health as well. So that's going to tie into another book in a second. So the biggest thing I learned out of this book was what foods our ancestors actually ate and which foods truly build a healthy, resilient body. And again, that's going to be nose-to-tail animal foods like oxtail, bone marrow, bone broth, different cuts of meat, liver, heart, anything like that, um, eggs, raw dairy, fermented foods, fish eggs, seafood, and properly prepared plant foods are the foods to prioritize the ones that'll build a healthy body. All right, the second book is Deep Nutrition by Dr. Kate Shananahan. Now, this book is very special to me because it's the first book that I read 
all about ancestral nutrition. Now, something where this book differs from nutrition and physical degeneration is it's this is a real page turner. This one I read so quick because it was so fascinating and she is a really excellent writer. I love Weston A. Price. I think he's amazing. It's a little more textbooky. So this one, <laughs> Deep Nutrition, is just an easier read and it's organized in a way that I think is a little bit more compelling, yet this has all the like hard evidence that's also really interesting. So Deep Nutrition is an amazing book. Um, she gets a lot of what she talks about from Weston A. Price, but definitely ties in some other unique things as well. So she splits the book into three parts. The first part talks all about the positive aspects of our ancestors of our ancestors diet. So it's going to be a lot of similar things that I just talked about with Weston A. Price's book. She really digs deep on how these foods affect our body. Um, she talks about how they affect our DNA, our health, our children's health, our children's athletic performance, our children's beauty. It's very interesting. Um, it was it's just fascinating she talks about eating organ meats meat cooked on the bone uh, raw fresh foods including veggies dairy and meat and then sprouted or fermented foods those are the main foods she focuses on being really important in the first section the second section she goes into the problems with the average modern diet she dives very deep into why seed oils are not good for you. This is the best explanation on why seed oils are bad for you I have ever heard. It's actually the first one that I ever heard too, but she really breaks it down. She uses science, she uses just common sense. She makes the science easier to understand. So it's very fascinating. And she also digs very deep into why sugar is not good for you. So those are the two things that get attacked pretty hard in the second section. But with that knowledge, it makes it a lot easier to avoid them since you know how bad they are for you. The third part is really just a helpful guide to make transitioning to healthy eating easier. There are recipes, there's a Q&A, there's grocery lists, there's different things like that to help you get started. The biggest things that I learned from this book are again just how our ancestors actually ate, um, how our nutrient intake affects our children's health. So I talked about briefly with the first book, Weston A. Price's book, that um, our ancestors had these practices to actually eat specific nutrient-dense foods first before trying to conceive. They also did pregnancy spacing, which is spacing having kids by about three-ish years, some cultures did four, to make sure you build up your nutrient reserves again before having another kid. So he talks about it briefly, but she goes a bit more in depth in this book about how important that is and just how our nutrient intake directly affects our children's health and gives more examples. She goes so far in depth about why seed oils are bad for you and why saturated fat is good for you, why saturated fat does not cause cardiovascular disease, heart disease, strokes, anything revolving clogging of the arteries and how seed oils are actually the ones that cause that so fascinating. I really, really liked this book. Uh, she also, yeah, she just really explains why cholesterol and saturated fat was vilified in the first place and gives you a lot of evidence to reassure you that it's actually an amazing food for you to eat. All right, the third book is Gut and Physiology Syndrome by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. She also has Gut and Psychology Syndrome. Um, I have not read that one. I've just read this one. This one focuses more on physiological gut issues. So Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, IBS, bloating, constipation, things like that, where her yellow book, the psychology one, focuses more on how your gut health affects autism, ADHD, um, bipolar disorder, the more mental side of gut health. So anyway, this is a really great book, especially if you have chronic gut issues. I highly recommend it. It will change the entire way you look at disease, dysfunction, and illness in the body. Um, in it, you really learn how poor gut health is the major root cause for the vast majority of health problems. The main reasons that poor gut health causes all these issues is because it decreases nutrient absorption, leading to deficiency. It also allows a river of toxicity to flow through your body through leaky gut. 
and an imbalanced gut microbiome leads to an overgrowth of pathogenic microbes and they cause a lot of issues in your body. So I really like this book. If you want to heal your health problems and prevent disease as you age, the best place to start is with your gut. From there, you can also focus on increasing the nutritional density of your diet, removing toxins from your body, and really learning to tune into your body's signals. These are the four biggest things that you can do to help support your health, and she goes into a lot of them in here. Now, she also lays out her specific diet called the GAPS diet, which is an excellent diet for healing. It is very, very similar to an ancestral diet, except that she makes... She makes a few more tweaks to make it more specific to healing your gut. So for example, in an ancestral diet, you can have sourdough bread because you're preparing it properly. But if you have gut issues, you really need to take a break from gluten for a while. You can have it later on, but while you're healing, you need to take a break from it. So a GAPS diet does not have things like sourdough bread in it. That's just one example. She also outlines the GAPS intro diet in this book, which is a very specific elimination diet for healing chronic gut issues. I really like it because she basically says if you have the most extreme worst issues that you've had for a long time, this is the diet that will heal you. So if you also have really, really horrible gut issues, you can just go along with her advice and heal great. And if you have a little less severe issues, you might not have to follow it to a T, but at least you know which foods to prioritize and which foods to avoid. So you know what that optimal gut healing diet looks like so you can emulate it as best as possible. So I think it is excellent for that reason. The biggest thing I took away from this book was the belief that we are truly capable of healing and recovering from practically every health problem out there. Somewhere in this book, she has a few pages worth of conditions that can be healed by healing your gut, eating a nutrient-dense diet, and just following these GAPS principles that she lays out. So she also has a whole book about success stories with GAPS and just interlays some of that into the book. So it really is such a powerful book. If you are starting to feel a little like, can I even heal or feeling a little helpless, this book will assure you that you absolutely can heal. Your body is so resilient and it's working on healing you all the time. This book was really exciting for me to read for that reason. I just had so much faith that I could help so many people heal and that this would work for like everyone and everyone could heal their gut. So I really love this book for that reason. A few specific things that she lays out how to do in the book or she lays out how to follow the GAPS diet. If you want to learn how to do the GAPS intro diet, I have a whole video on that. So I'll link that one up above and down below. But essentially, there's also the GAPS full diet. There's a meat only GAPS diet. There's a few different variations and she lays out how to do all of them in this book. She talks about how to improve bile flow, how to improve constipation, how to fix your microbiome, and a lot of other really fascinating things. Okay, so the fourth book is Real Food for Pregnancy by Lily Nichols. I think everyone should read this book, even if you're not pregnant. If you're pregnant, just a thousand percent read this book. Go buy it right now. If you're planning on conceiving in the next like four years or whatever, I would read it now because the sooner you start preparing, the better. In this book, she really lays out what foods are the most nutrient dense, which foods are the most harmful, and she really combines the ancestral perspective and the scientific perspective really well. So she does tailor it towards pregnant women. So some of the things that she covers are flaws in the mainstream pregnancy recommendations. However, this parallels with just flaws in mainstream nutrition recommendations. She also covers what nutrients build a healthy baby, the best foods to get these nutrients, the challenges of a vegetarian diet and how it's really not optimal for pregnancy, um, foods to avoid. She has meal plans and recipes in there. She has info about supplementing and lab testing if that's something you're interested in. She talks about how to deal with common pregnancy complications. She talks about the benefits of exercise for pregnancy and how to modify exercise to make it safe. She talks about the importance of avoiding toxins um, and she gives them she gives specific advice on how to avoid those toxins. She talks about stress, mental health. Um, oh, a lot of helpful info about after your baby is born. A lot of people don't think about the postpartum time, but she gives a lot of helpful insight on preparing for postpartum. 
She talks about the importance of pregnancy spacing again. Again, that is spacing your pregnancies about at least two, but more ideally three years apart to rebuild your nutrient stores again before you have your next baby. Yeah, and those are just a few things that she covers. Now, the reason I like this for everyone, not just pregnant women, is because she talks about the specifics in here of what nutrients are in liver, what nutrients are in bone broth, and how they directly affect your body. What nutrients in liver will actually affect specific areas of your health, how the vitamin A will help your eyes. It'll help, if you are pregnant, it'll help your baby's organ development. But she just goes so specifically into why to eat these foods. So there is a lot of crossover you'll probably see from all the books I'm recommending. But the reason I picked each of these ones is because they address a different component that I think is really important. So in here, she's just so detailed about why to eat those nutrient dense foods. And she really puts into perspective, like how much protein you should be getting from your diet, how much fat you should be getting from your diet and how you can actually get that. She talks a lot in here about how mainstream pregnancy recommendations are way too high in carbs and will not meet your nutrient recommendations by following it. And that's just so similar to mainstream nutrition advice in general. General. Since this is a book for pregnancy, I will touch a little bit more on some of the things she goes over for that. So during pregnancy, about 10% of the nutrients that you have stored in your body goes to building your baby. And that is a lot of nutrients to give away. That's why it's so important that you actually have all your nutrient stores topped off before you go into pregnancy and you know how to eat throughout your pregnancy and in postpartum to be able to rebuild those nutrient stores again. How well you nourish yourself directly affects your pregnancy and your child's health. So she goes over how nourishing yourself can actually decrease a lot of really common pregnancy symptoms. So you can, you know, avoid morning sickness, avoid that horrible fatigue, just avoid a lot of those symptoms. Now, sometimes they will still happen. It's not a magical fix, but you can decrease a lot of them and feel a lot better during pregnancy if you do the prep ahead of time, like she talks about here. And also it goes into building a healthy baby. So nutrient deficiencies have been linked to a lot of health problems with babies. So you could have um, organ malformation, you could have low birth weight, impaired cognitive development, neural tube defects, and more. So this book is so great for preventing any complications with your child's health. And it's also really great for preventing birth complications and just having a healthier birth in general. She's also not fear-mongering. I know that's something that's really important to avoid when you're pregnant. You don't wanna hear it that way. She is very positive and very encouraging. So that's another part I love about this book. I also wanna note that Lily Nichols has another book that she co-authored with Lisa Hendrickson Jack, and it's called Real Food for Fertility. I have read that one too, and I think that is another excellent book. This one is more geared towards if you're pregnant, while Real Food for Fertility is more geared towards preconception time and preparing for pregnancy. There's definitely some overlap, but there's definitely some differences as well. So like in this book, you'll get more like what postpartum is like, how to prepare for it, how to exercise during pregnancy, what those pregnancy complications are and how you can naturally you know, avoid them and help get through them faster. While Real Food for Fertility goes over like tracking your cycle and making sure your hormones are good before you start trying to conceive and different things like that, the nutrition is is pretty similar and both books are excellent for going over that. Um, I feel like from the nutritional perspective, they are kind of similar. So I didn't put both of them in this video, um, but just a note, both are excellent. If you're in the preconception phase, you might wanna go for the other book instead. All right, book number five, Detoxify or Die by Sherry A. Rogers. Now this, this book convinced me that toxins are the primary cause of cancer and just horrible diseases in the body. You'll probably see a theme here over the books, what those main causes of health issues are. And they really are nutrient deficiencies, poor gut health, toxin overload, and then just stress and like not listening to your body. So this book really covers something that none of the other books do to the same extent. A lot of them touch on it briefly, but this is a deep dive into how toxins are horrible for you 
and just what the most common sources of these toxins are because they can kind of elude you at first and then you start learning them and you're like, oh, phytholates and, you know, endocrine disruptors and these different things that I need to avoid. Where are they? What are they in? So she actually goes over what they're in so that you can start seeing these things around you and making the changes. She links a gazillion studies of toxins, you know, just causing these different health issues. So I think it's really helpful on that front as well. Uh, a thing that surprised me a ton about this book is this book was written in 2002. It was published in 2002, which means that there was a lot of research that went into it beforehand. So that was slightly discouraging to me that we have known this info for over 20 years and you know, not done as much as I'd hope about it, but a lot of people do know about toxins and are sharing more about it now. And it really comes down to focusing on what you can do. I will say it's a little depressing <laughs> because there are toxins all over the place and a lot of them come from people just being kind of greedy and not caring that they're putting a lot of toxins into the world that harm other people's health because they're making a profit and it's cheaper for them. So they just keep on doing it. So that was a little disheartening, but I think it's a really helpful book still. For me, it just really drilled in how important avoiding toxins was and went over what those most common sources of toxins are so that I could you know, take a lot of this into my own hands and select things for myself, for my life to minimize toxin exposure to the best of my ability. After you read it, I would recommend just changing things in your life, you know, moving to get more natural fibers and avoid polyester, getting cleaner beauty products, you know, maybe making some of your own stuff. I'll make my own toothpaste, for example, and, you know, getting a good water filter. I would make these changes and then to an extent, I would almost forget a little bit about it. Otherwise, you're gonna go crazy if you're constantly looking around being like, oh my God, there's toxins in that or that. And I don't think that's healthy. So I would read it. I would learn all about it and make all these changes and then kind of chill out a little bit and realize that your body's resilient. And if you control a lot of what's in your house and what you eat, and just having healthy habits that will help you a ton with toxins and if a few get in there because you know a car drove by you and there's some car exhaust like don't freak out it's not the end of the world all right book number six is the carnivore code by dr paul saladino now i know this book says carnivore in it but even if you're not carnivore not going carnivore i highly recommend it i've never gone full carnivore personally and i learned so much from this book now something really interesting for me is i read this book or at least i started reading this book when i was backpacking one year so i really liked hearing about just a natural perspective on what to eat while I was actually outside. So one of the things that um, Dr. Saladino mentions in this book is looking around in nature and seeing what's available to you to eat. So where I am right now, there are squirrel, there are birds, some little quails will come around sometimes. There's probably turkey around here. There's definitely deer around here. There is wild boar somewhere around here, but I don't think it's quite <laughs> where I am right now. So those are some examples and food like, I don't really see a lot of plant foods around. Sometimes mushrooms will pop up here. I don't know how to identify them, so I'm not gonna risk that. But there's not a lot of plant foods. Um, sometimes you might see miner's lettuce around. But yeah, just looking around in nature and thinking about what you would eat, I just loved that that he talked about in this book. Now the thing that he talks about so well in this book that's not quite covered to the same extent in the others is anti-nutrients in plant foods and how they harm you. Now, I do think he goes a little more intense than I agree with. I don't think all plant foods are like trying to kill you. I don't think it's quite that extreme, which he doesn't necessarily say that, but it can come across a little heavily like that. Um, yeah, but I do think he does a really good job about describing the specific toxins, lectins, oxalates, 
phytic acid, um, different things like that, and how they harm you. He definitely brings the scientific and the ancestral side into this as well. Something I really liked was he described how plants don't want to be eaten and they can't fight back and they can't right, run away. And that's why they produce these plant defense mechanisms. He also describes how the seeds of the plant, so nuts, seeds, legumes, and grains have the most anti-nutrients in them because that's the plant's baby. It's the way the plant is going to reproduce and produce more and more of the same plant. So they really want to protect the seeds and they put the most anti-nutrients in the seeds. That's why in the other books I was talking about, there was a strong emphasis on soaking, sprouting, fermenting your grains first. That really decreases the anti-nutrients. So he talks about how to understand which foods are going to be higher in anti-nutrients and more harmful for your gut and your overall health and which ones are going to be less. So for example, he mentions how root veggies don't really need as much anti-nutrients because they're out under the ground, which protects them a lot. He talks about how fruits is something a plant actually wants you to eat because a lot of animals, they'll eat the fruit, swallow the pit, you know, poo it out and then it's basically in a pile of fertilizer to grow into a tree or they'll just spit it out and throw it over there and then, you know, the seed is in the ground ready to, ready to grow into a plant again. So the fruit helps animals come and spread the seed for the plant. So fruits are very, very low in anti-nutrients as well. So anyway, I just really like the perspective he brought. I thought it made it really easy to understand what plant foods are more harmful and what plant foods are not gonna be so bad. And then he also really emphasizes the importance of eating meat, eating animal foods, the exact nutrients that are in there, why they're so beneficial, all that kind of stuff. So that's why I really like The Carnivore Code. He did come out with a second book. I'm blanking on what it's called. I have it, I haven't read it yet, but it is a cookbook that he did with the Strong Sisters. And that one has like a prefaces that I've kind of glanced over, but again, I haven't read it quite yet. And in that one, he talks more about animal-based eating instead of carnivore. So he does go on later to kind of explain how some of these plants can have some benefits. But anyway, I still really like this one. These six books together just really outline the fundamentals of health. I think they are absolutely excellent. They are absolutely the top six books that I have read on nutrition and health. And if you're wanting to really learn a lot so that you can take your health into your own hands, heal your gut, nourish your body, and be the healthiest possible, I really recommend you check out these. There are definitely other great ones out there, but I wanted to narrow it down to the six that I thought were the most impactful, especially because it can start to feel a little repetitive after a while of reading the same genre. So I wanted you to have the best ones to start with. And if you want another really awesome resource to help you out in your healing journey, I have a free training video all about how to heal your gut by getting your digestive system to work like an efficient machine. And I share a lot of really helpful things that helped me on my own journey and have helped my clients as well to heal their gut, nourish their body and thrive. So if you want to check that out, I'll have it linked down below. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more videos about gut health and ancestral nutrition, be sure to subscribe because I post new videos every single week about just that. And yeah, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.